a wee bit about what I was mentioning last week. I wanted to leave the idea regarding life's act be of we are what we eat. I really wanted a lot of you to be able to find something on your own, but a couple of things to help spur on perhaps some of you. Refreshing your memory. It appears to be absolutely correct that we are what we eat. And in various forms, all the way from religious to psychological, to right now, apparently strictly physical, this message has always been put out by life through man to man. And it is an ACB, an ACBI, apparently correct but impossible on the basis that in so far as the binary world goes, it would be the opposite. It would be as though, I just say you had an internal combustion engine that was set up to run on diesel fuel. And let us assume that you could run in liquid vitamin C and mix it in with diesel fuel and it wouldn't interfere. But the engine couldn't do anything with the liquefied vitamin C. Everything that takes in energy, everything that uses it, and now we're talking about man, the Vita Machina, the living energy transformer, would be taking in certain energies, but each person is wired up so that all the energy to which they are exposed, to which they may even ingest, at least in part, is not necessarily that which they can use, which they are wired up to use, which they are scheduled to intake and to transform. And so therefore, some of what comes into humans at the very least is not digested. It does not become part of them. And at the binary level, the way it appears, it would be, and so far as possible, it would be the opposite. But now, and also, I reminded you, or I pointed out to you last week, that if it were true that we are what we eat, then everything that man currently believes, everything that he apparently has been told by the gods, by supermen on earth, all the things that he seems to feel to be true through intuition would be correct. That all the ideas that I am what I am because of the influences of my life, I am what I am because of influences outside of me, but that happen primarily in the environment since I have been in existence. That all of that would be true. Let me carry that just a little bit further. If man were what he eats, then everybody would be undergoing a continual, would be in a continual state of change. You would not even be able to identify one another, other than the fact that, hey, you look like Sam. I mean, the Sam that I've known for 20 years and the Sam that I was talking to five minutes ago, but you walked around the corner to get a pack of cigarettes and now that you're back, you're somebody else. You know, Alfred Hitchcock or the Twilight Zone lives. Somebody has taken over Sam's body. You know, the pods have taken over. Because if you were what you ate, if you were what you ingested, then everything that you heard, to which you, for whatever reason, seemed to give a fair amount of your attention, everything that you read that seemed to be of some importance, that seemed to tickle your imagination, you would be undergoing a, con be in a continual state of change. Whereas, without giving you the blues, not intending to give you the blues, I've been pointing out, and many of you already realize, that being in a continual state of change is certainly not man's problem. The problem is, it's finding enough room to maneuver it all to where you might be able, might be able, to change the color on one of your toenails if you had painted toenails, that you might be able to move the part in your hair over a silly millimeter. Maybe. But certainly not anything such as, I believe I'll change my mind. <laughs> For I believe that I have been living now 35 years being somewhat of a dumbass. I think I'll stop that. I have been living now for 29 years, and I have had a rather closed mind on politics. What the hell? I'll, I just drop it. <laughs> I have been 
fairly hostile all these many scores of years toward my fellow man. For no particular reason, I just don't like people. But hey, I'm getting older, I don't know how much longer. Tomorrow, everybody's my buddy. But I'm still asking you the kinds of questions that I do periodically is what is going on, assuming that you have made something out of it since last week, you've had that time that we are not what we eat ordinarily. There is like a little Jesse James hidden in this. It is another part of the way things are structured that can make things appear to be one way and it can appear to be a manifestation of some sort of cosmic or psychological rule, whereas it is not, and it's this, that you can eat something, of course by eat I'm including everything, your yellow circuit, blue circuit, perceptions, but you can eat something that seems to suddenly trigger a latent potential that you had. It is on this basis, and everyone has had some experience in this. It may have been so small that you had no reason to notice it, but it is very large. It is salient in the world of literature, all of the arts, movies, and it goes like this. A character in a play can be engaged in an inner or an external monologue with himself, and he says, my parents put me out to sea, signed me up with a merchant ship when I was only 15 years old out of Genoa, me trying to grow up those first few months away from my family, out there at sea in the loneliness, it struck me, I am truly alone. But then I looked around at my fellow shipmates and I realized everybody is alone. Such things happen in real life. They happen in real life or they would not happen in the so-called arts that apparently there was some moment of some type of epiphany that someone says, I seem to be of a certain kind of mindset. I seem to have had a certain attitude about a certain thing, and then it was as though a moment, an incident happened, and I realized something. Uh, you should know that so-called religious literature is based upon, that's the highlights of all those books, but it is also throughout all mundane literature. It is part of ordinary walking around common knowledge. People accept the fact that something can happen. Maybe not to me, I've never been that sort. I've never been very introspective, but I see movies, I hear someone go through the kind of scenario that I just described about the man saying, I suddenly realize that we're all alone that everyone accepts it, that this happens, which is further proof that we are what we eat, that your experiences do make a difference. If the man had not shipped out on a sailing vessel, he would have never had this realization, be it right or wrong or of any great profit, but he would have never had this realization that to him seems to be of some importance that I realize we're all here alone. This would never happen if he had stayed back there in Italy, if his family hadn't almost shanghaied him and put him out to work at an early age, if he had stayed there and finished school, if he'd become a basket weaver. He would have never had the opportunity to be staying out there on a deck out in the middle of the Atlantic on a cold night thinking, here I am, a little 18-year-old kid, and I'm all alone. But wait, 
We're all, all alone. The truth is, and there's a lot more to this than me attempting to continue to prove over little points that I'm correct, because you've got to see it, because I'm not correct. As long as you think I'm correct, it's a waste of time. But you've got to see that that is a part of the wiring system, that we believe that we are what we eat, that we are the sum total of our experience, and maybe somewhere, somewhere over in the corner, genetics plays some little small part. But regardless of what part, because medical science, psychology cannot even agree on what part, religions, well, within themselves, they sort of agree how much it is. But us sophisticated people, there's real no statistical proof as to what degree if any genetics plays. The rest of it is obviously the influences of life, what we eat while we're alive. The ideas we eat, the experiences we ingest, the emotions we digest, the physical ups and downs upon which we chew and nice our teeth. There's that canal and ganache your teeth. But along with that, it's just further proof of the kind of examples I'm making up that things happen in individual lives that were it not for the circumstance, then this insight, and all of you, I just made up one. I guess if I thought for a second, all of you should be able to think right quick to Shakespeare, Balzac, Harold Robbins, Erskine Caldwell, you know, the Knight Rider, Hill Street Blues, anything. Literature that catches the fancy of people for any length of time, or movies, the arts. Somewhere in there, a figure has some kind of moment of enlightenment, even if it was no more than the example I made up, that this young kid suddenly realizes to him, he sees something, hey, it's not just me here, out away from my family at an early age, lonesome, windswept, soaked. It's not just me feeling alone. I realize we're all, everybody on this planet, we're all all alone. All right, that's good for a three-hour play. It's good for a 500-page book that could last hundreds of years that people still read it. And there's no doubt in anyone's hardwired mind, their molecular feeling reaction toward this, that yes, that's true. And had it not been for the circumstances, that person, that figure, that character would not have realized it. But the thing is, there are things that people eat that triggers, through the digestion of it, a potential. This is no excuse. This is no exception to what I was describing last week and mentioning again this week. But it is so dastardly clever. It is a two-dimensional reflection of something else going on. I left you last week with a kind of rhetorical question about two things that you could do once you begin to get a, your own view of what I'm pointing at with these words about we are what we eat being backwards. If you begin to get a personal grasp of this, that what I have been eating May I please point out to you again, this is not very exotic. It is not very occult. It barely meets the Kmart minimum as being mystical. <laughs> you just have to look at your own life. It should take you all of two or three seconds of what have I done, what has happened to me in my life that changed me? What books have I read? What happened to me? My father died from smoking three packs of unfiltered camels a day. <laughs> I don't know. It was, <laughs> it was such a heartbreak. My mother was an alcoholic. My mother was a hypercontractor. <laughs> That's somebody that builds up diseases in their mind. <laughs> At least that's what I was told by a quasi-informed source. But somebody can say, and I realize how this hurt 
somebody else. Boy, did I learn my lesson. But now you should know that that's not true. Or boy, the book I read, somebody brings up, yeah, I remember that book, it changed my life. I remember I read that, I can still remember. I remember when I, somebody told me about the book. I was a freshman, I was up at Oakhurst. I remember I rushed out, I remember the person that lent me the book. I remember the first night I sat down, it changed my life. And you know it's a lie. You talked about it, now you remember it. But it didn't change your life, it didn't change anything. You got and talked about it, you might remember that. But none of this has changed anything. Everything you ate seemed to have gone in, and it just simply became you. You didn't become it. It's just obvious once you see it. But then, rather than giving you the after-dinner blues, or the after-dinner mint blues, look at it this way. There is this possibility with a few people, everyone else. With everyone else, it's of no consequence. But once you begin to see it, look at this. All of this that seems to be not I is out here. You seem to have very little control over it. You don't decide which books are published. You don't decide who puts out new records. You don't decide what your neighbors are going to do. You don't decide even what your lover is going to act like tomorrow. So everything you eat becomes you. And once you begin to get a grasp of this, how about this? If you could begin to, I'm making this a rhetorical, hint, hint, that you could begin to expand your hunger, begin to extend your taste, and begin to affect your digestive system. Now, without people knowing it, it's what I could take much of the so-called religious ideas throughout the ages and point out to you that under other guises, life was talking about that. And it comes out in a very strange fashion of all sorts of rituals, worships, would-be attempts to alter one's behavior for a future reward in some cosmic time zone unknown to mortal man when what they're talking about would be right now, if you could expand your own hunger, if you could extend what seems to be your present taste, and you could directly affect your own digestive system. Enough rhetorical, you can do it. When you go through this enough, you're going to find that there are discernible stages. I've never mentioned this to anyone, and some of you have already had taste of it, and I have talked about it sort of vaguely, but there are distinct, when I say stages, I'm talking just as physical as I can talk, while reminding you that when I say physical, of course, I'm including what you call your mental activities, your own personality, your own soul, whatever foolish terms you may still be using. But there are absolutely discernible biochemical stages that happen wherein your behavior, wherein what you seem to feel, wherein what seems to be your moods, change, and they change permanently. But you can start out and you can directly try and expand your own hunger. Once you notice that you can talk a good game, you can sit around over coffee at an all-night diner, or you can sit at home and look over a catalog and Think, I think I'll go to art school at night, or I believe I'll go back to college and I'll get my master's in economics, or voodoo. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't. You simply talk about it, but once you see that I have hunger, hungers, that once I see it, I can write them down in 30 seconds probably. No matter what I say, I keep doing the same things over and over. That I only have a very limited range of hunger. If I do happen to be exposed to something to which I have no natural hunger, music, painting, different types of people, and I'm suddenly just thrown in with a group of people or a person, 
or a piece of music that I have no natural hunger for, my taste immediately goes. I simply shut it out. Not, of course, that there is any intrinsic value, worth, or nourishment in ordinary activities, music, people, any more than what you're already inclined to have a taste for. But by being able to expand your own hunger and your own taste, you can then affect the situation wherein everything that you eat becomes you. And there is no room to maneuver. That even when you take in things accidentally, you're force fed a brand new impression of a different type of person, different kinds of music, etc. Your body rejects that which it is not wired up to digest already. I'm not going to tell you, but some of you, it should strike you with a certain thought that much the so-called religious activity throughout the world, throughout the years, was unknowingly based on this. Although once it gets out into ordinary life, people are not motivated, they're not supposed to be, but they're not motivated, they're not driven to actively pursue it, but they're talking about it. The tenets of the religion are based upon, hey, all of you people should expand your taste, your hunger, and you're to shake up your digestive system. Doesn't sound very religious, but if you can get a view of this, you'll see that that is right at the heart of what seems to be the practice of all the world's major religions. Change the subject. Ha ha. Some night I'm actually going to try and do that. <laughs> instead, of just, instead of just saying it, I'm actually going to gnash my teeth and try and actually change the subject. <sighs> Let's go back to the world of science. And me continuing to refer to what seems to be our existence as Flatland or Flatville, the binary world that everything seems to be based upon the good old yin yang, the opposites, opposing forces, and I have continued to point out to you, allegorically and otherwise, that behind everything here is there is a triaxial dance. There are three forces, for lack of a for lack of me wanting to put any other word on it right now, there are three forces going on. And the continuing difficulty, as all of you would acknowledge without even being tortured, that even when you think that you see, yeah, there's gotta be three forces, all you gotta do is take another breath, and the third one has disappeared again. Or you thought you almost saw it, but as soon as you thought you saw it, whatever it was that thought it saw the third force, it suddenly sucked all the energy out of that, and that's what was making you try to look at it, and it's gone again. Or something to that effect. But there might be ways that I could try and pull your attention slightly askew from where you are. The binary world, for instance, is really a kind of footprint of our trinary heritage. And the voices that speak to many of you, your own internal voices, that is, of wondering whether this is all allegorical. Why is it that you can seem to see so much, but you have such difficulty in trying to see a third force going on? The trinary world as I keep hinting, is behind all of this. And I don't mean that that's the end of it, but that is immediately behind what's going on here, that which is visible, that which is perceptible to ordinary consciousness. But the tri trinary world is always here. 
that is always amongst us, in that, among other possible descriptions, in that it is the glue holding together the apparent opposites of our ordinarily perceived binary existence. All of you should know, even those of you just coming in seeing some of these tapes, you should be able to look around. You should be able to look into your own nervous system, your own mind, your own personality, and see that everything seems to be based upon a set of opposites, of opposing forces all the way from good and evil to right and wrong to true and false to anything else you can come up with. Yin yang, male and female, positive and negative. You should also be able to realize with a certain minuscule amount of real effort, if you belong in this, that trying to study the world through opposites, as it has always been conceived, leads nowhere. It will lead you into a position of, at best, fanaticism. It will simply reinforce the wiring of your own present system but it explains nothing. It can apparently help solidify your position in one of the armed camps that we are right, us white Southern Baptists, we are right, us European Catholic Slavs, we are right, whoever we are, whatever we believe, we are right. These other people, who are in direct opposition to us are wrong. In my foolishness, on a hot summer's day, I will assume that anyone hearing this, that most of you, at least suspect that that's not going anywhere. It hasn't gone anywhere for 6,000 years. It hadn't moved, it hadn't moved this far for the few people in this. It serves its purpose. It seems to move out in the ordinary world People fight, they kill, they slobber, <laughs> they rape, pillage, and do other assorted humane things. But for a few people, I would just foolishly assume that you at least smell something fishy. And so then the feeling, all right, well, that's all I can see. Where is this third force? If the world were indeed as it appears to be, if it were all a matter of opposites, don't you see that everything would fall apart? I'm telling you real physics now. Unless there was something to hold those two opposites together, they would annihilate one another, if they indeed exist the way they appear to be. If there were, as your forefathers believed, the forces of godliness, goodness, not, you got that, and then everything else. You know, the good old religious idea, if you ain't for me, you're against me. That didn't come from Joseph Stalin, as many of you believe. The gods of your forefathers, the first person ever said that, because you've got the two camps. Here's the goodness, the godly forces, and then the anti-goodness forces. There's no room for anything else. That's it. You're either with us or against it, right? Unless, of course, you're an attorney. <laughs> But if, if everything, that's an old joke about the fence that divided heaven and hell. That's another, that there was an absolute fence. I shouldn't have started this. And, you know, the God was in charge of the heaven side, and then the anti-God, the evil force, the prince of darkness was in charge of the other side of the fence, and one day, the good guy, the good force said, hey, the fence, somebody's moved it over. You're encroaching my territory. And the prince of darkness said, no, nah, I ain't. It's your imagination. He said, yeah, I am. He said, you either move it, I'm going to sue you. And Satan said, yeah, where are you going to find an attorney? <laughs> Take that off the tape. That was just a crude joke. 
That should have been a religious joke. I should have changed it. If indeed everything was divided up on this planet, all the known universe, if it was strictly, now just listen quick, anybody that belongs in this, you'll be able to hear this is an absolute scientific law of physics that has never been recognized. Not like this. If everything was simply divided up into two camps, they would annihilate each other. Either that or the whole machinery of life would freeze up, which would be the same thing. You could not have all of reality, all of everything divided into two camps and that's it. The trinary world behind all of this, at the very least, is that which holds those two together. The apparent opposites that seem to be, appear to be the basis of ordinary reality. Change the subject again. <laughs> Has anyone noticed that in the great binary world of Flat City, in that great country of horizontally, that to become an expert in ordinary affairs is to become a pessimist? I can wait a second and everyone try and flash on some exception you can think about it, some figure that didn't seem to be, he doesn't really fit. But you think about it again. And then what seems to come to mind, was he apparently an expert in one field? Because if you expand it, he seemed to have had some knowledge or some wherewithal or some inventive spirit in a couple of fields, you've blown it. But to become generally in the ordinary world an expert, as they would call it, to become an expert in some field in general is to become a pessimist. I ask you again, what purpose is being served in life? I'll ask you further, why does this seem to be so nonspecific at times? Why is it that all experts, generally, I've given you a few moments, those of you who want to, to let the voices run through and to try and check and see whether this might be true or not, all the way from ecologists, physicists. Of course, they're going to have a little age on them now to ever be recognized as an expert. You should know that in life by now. You don't have experts at the age of 20 or 30. You can have somebody that has a promising future. But to be an expert, you got to start be getting long in the toothies. But when somebody apparently is recognized as an expert, physics, economics, political, con well, strike that. Notice, am I right or am I wrong? To become an expert, generally, is synonymous with becoming a pessimist. Now let's get into more exotic fields. How about this? Do you find any exception, or do you still feel the vibrations of the truth to take that into the so-called fields of spirituality? That those that seem to be an expert that yes, I'm an expert on the teachings of Swami so-and-so. His gigantic 40,000 word tome, I'm the only person who's ever read it all the way through. I've read it through 20 times. I have it memorized. I'm the world's leading expert. And some other semi-experts, or some more people, say yes he is. He is the living expert on this. How about the Pope? They don't really refer to him specifically, but just to pick out an obvious example, is the living expert on Christianity. The man's a walking pessimist. I mean, sure, his clothes are bright and colorful. 
<laughs> He'd fit in in Nashville at the Grand Ole Opry. I, but the man's a pessimist. Anybody. The general rule I'm pointing out to you. Anybody who becomes an expert generally has become a pessimist. Why? What could be going on? What is life up to? Because at first, if I'd built this up through a different, slightly different approach, if I can do it now, those of you really listening, you would think someone who believes I want to expand my horizon, somebody in their early age and they pursue education, they try and vary their interests and pursue you know, the arts and sports, and they really try to use their mind and they perhaps have several majors when they're in college. You would, it's already wired into people that you would be quite willing, if you're ordinary, to believe, to go along with me if I would point out all right, that sort of thing. The more you learn about some subject, perhaps the man spends 10 or 15 years in college and then he finally, it strikes him that he is very interested in economics or history. And then for the next five years, he really applies himself. He begins to write papers, he even gets a book published. First thing you know, the man's hitting 50 and he's recognized as the leading expert in the world on medieval European history. And you would think, well, that's meant something. If the man is really the walking compendium of knowledge of the Middle Ages of European history, I mean, think of the crap that man knows. Think of all the anecdotes, all the little things, all the pieces of history that he can tie together, he can weave a little tapestry in his own mind of how things built up and how they changed from the you know, coming into the Industrial Revolution. Boy, I, I bet something to know that much. Get him on a talk show, or see he writes a piece, a review for the New York Times book review, write something Atlantic Monthly on history, on the lessons of history. What we should learn in the 80s, the 1980s, from people in the 1580s. Surely you know by now. You're going to pick it up and read it. It ain't going to be good news. As soon as they say, this man, and the little squid up the top, gives the author's name, professor, or Dr. So-and-so, and it says, probably, just for those of you that picked up this magazine by accident and not hip enough, Dr. So-and-so is considered the world's leading expert on middle, medieval European history. Well, you know already it's going to be bad news when he tells you the lessons to be learned. It's going to be we haven't learned anything, or it's going to be we're repeating it all. It's going to be a discourse on pessimism. What is going on that you become an expert and you become simultaneously a pessimist? Now, none of you are going to be, I don't know whether to say blasé or dumbass. I can't, which one of those are French? Uh, <laughs> to believe that to become an expert in any field is simply to realize, hey, life is bad news. Life, you know, it does suck. And you're probably better off being dumb and uneducated because you don't realize it. You're out there working in the Ford plant or digging ditches and you believe, hey, someday I'll actually hit the lottery. Um, I, I got an uncle somewhere that I don't know about. They'll die and leave me money. I'm going to lose a wisdom tooth, and I'll wake up in the morning under my pillow being your Corvette. You know, people believe that, some people think. So wouldn't you be better off? Now, none of you people can be that misled, surely. Simply becoming an expert that can't be the basis of someone becoming a pessimist, just that you become an expert in any given field and it suddenly strikes you. Somewhere down the line is that moment it strikes you, good grief. Now, major in economics, political science, history, math, and I got this far and it's suddenly, it's all began to, it's coming together, I'm beginning to see the full picture, life sucks, we're all done for. Did all this education did that? No. At least I'm hinting to you, no. But what would be going on in life? That it is, as a rule, a simultaneous occurrence 
that to be an expert in some ordinary field, to become an expert is to become a pessimist. And it's a good thing that you have met me specializing in this kind of information because I am probably one of probably the world's expert on the, well. I don't guess we should pursue that. At least I have to tell you the sad, sad truth. <laughs> Next subject. Now, I've been thinking about buying a new mannerism rather than this one. But I must tell you this, two years ago, I didn't even have this one. I just, I could barely afford this. Was a, it was on sale, so I got this one. I almost went for this one. But it was $20 more than this one. <laughs> The one I really wanted was this one, but Benny Hill already had it. <laughs> Plus, it makes your underwear draw up and it's uncomfortable. <laughs> Let's go back into the world of physics and ordinary people. Here's one that many people should be able to ignore. And some of you may hear it right quick and not like it at all. Does everyone remember the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in quantum physics, a piece of it, wherein they discovered some time ago that when they get down to a certain point that the kind of instrument studying the submolecular or the subatomic at the subatomic level. Let's just call it the size, the interference of the size of the instruments involved to make this level perceptive in some way, they discovered interferes with what seems to be, quote, the reality of that which they're observing, that they're trying to observe the movements of subatomic particles. But the kind of equipment it takes to get down and look at them, they discovered, changes them. And that seemed to be revolutionary. It's still being debated, or it's still being debated as to what it might mean. And there are still a few sore heads that don't, don't even like the whole idea. <laughs> but, and as some of you know that have seen more of these tapes, I periodically delve into that world. And to show you, or to hint to you, that some of the things I'm talking about have a corollary already known in the physical, the so-called physical world, as opposed to what you believe this is supposed to be about, the wit, a spiritual, religious world, or some such. And as I've also pointed out, we're ahead of ourselves. I'm ahead of the time, but it's not only the sub-atomic level, it's at the other end. But it's a long way before they're ever, if ever, they're going to be confronted with the kind of instruments trying to get that far, but they're going to find the same thing, turn inside out. But back to the middle ground, us. That seemed to be revolutionary. As I said, many of you are right now, if you'd never heard of it, and you read about it, and you're just fairly educated, fairly intelligent, when you first read about it, you think, no, you know, there's got to be some kind of reality going on. And you're going to tell me that now, trying to look at something, little non-human molecules moving about that you try to look at one and to study exactly where it is or what its momentum is. And you're going to tell me that by getting down there and getting all these instruments and looking at it, that the looking at it, the effect of looking at it, changed it to where now your observations are invalid? And that's not true. That's from the twilight zone. You know, reality is especially things like that. It is not astounding, though. It is not new. Here you are, you little bundle, you sweet little bundle of molecules, you, 
subatomic in part. Much of you are subatomic, yeah. but you think of yourself as being. <laughs> but here you are, you're driving along the freeway, you're singing along with the, the radio, traffic stops, and you're still singing along, da, da, da. thinking about what you're going to do that night, catching a glimpse of yourself in the rearview mirror, and suddenly you look around the car next to you, somebody's looking at you, and what happens? <laughs> the mere act of observation has changed that which is being observed. You think it's new? How about the good old Genesis story? Adam and Eve were going along, seemed to have been getting into their own groove, and suddenly, the best I can recall the kind of story, this voice comes down, this outside observer and said, did you eat off that tree? And suddenly, everything changed. And yet, in quantum mechanics, they found it strange, or as I said, when ordinary people first hear of it, they disbelieve it, that the mere act of observing something changes it. All right, perhaps, perhaps down at sub, sub, some subatomic level, you know, what does that have to do with me? Trying to make the payments on the car. I don't have time to worry about this kind of exotic, these exotic kind of theories in physics. It means nothing. <coughs> Now to the part that I said some people will be able to not hear it. Every attempt, all the way from that which is most mechanical and already hardwired and which really causes no alteration in a person's life, all the way from that to people who apparently are sincerely attempting to change themselves through some system, that they do give up all meat, they do give up all alcohol, they do shave their head, they do go join some community somewhere and have to dress differently. They do start attending a mass, a prayer service, on certain days, at certain hours. The whole range is any attempt to, quote, work on oneself requires that you observe, that you study that, hey, there is this me and I've got to make this change. The mere attempt to study oneself already changes immediately the self, apparently, to be worked on. Notice how many people manage not to hear it. <laughs> many people who hear some of the first things that I might say about the near impossibility of change, how there is almost no room to maneuver. Not that we're just living robots because that's too strong to say to people. But many people who hear this immediately disavow it on the basis that they have tried to make some change in their life. That maybe I just decide all right, I've hit a certain age and my thighs are beginning to look like two-day-old skim milk. I'm overweight and I got two or three, all this. And suddenly down the street has opened up a health spa. By God, I'm going to give it a try. I, I will. I'm ashamed how big and fat and ugly and slavery I am. But you buy yourself some little leotards or you go down there first and you talk to the people and you look inside and somebody comforts you and say, hey, Everybody's not beautiful people like you see in there. When they first came here, they looked like, they looked as, well, they weren't like that. Don't feel bad. And they tell you what to buy. They tell you when to be here. They give you a little schedule, and they give you a suggested diet. And you leave, and you give them your money, and you say, all right, I'll be back starting tomorrow. And you leave, and you feel better. And you haven't done, as they say in medical circles, you haven't done diddly squat, I believe it is. 
but you feel better. And perhaps you pursue it a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and you tell everyone around you how much better you feel. You may lose two pounds. You sweat and you go through this procedure. People go back and attempt to join a church, or people do join a church. People apparently get converted to some kind of religious system. They go join a self-help group. And they say, I feel better. And then voices, of course, in you, if you're ordinary, can then hear the kind of things I say and say, you know, it's you against the world. It's just a cockeyed theory. People do try to change, and they do benefit. Or else the whole world's lying. They say they feel better. I mean, even if the person did not ever lose enough weight to get down to the standard charts from the insurance companies, the person said they felt better. They're glad they did it. Who are you to pick on them? I'm not picking on them. Because the mere act of attempting to work on oneself, which first starts off, you got to study yourself in some way. You got to study yourself and say, I'm too fat. You got to study yourself in some way and say, I am living an unprofitable life. I'm going against the teachings of my father's religion. I left it. I feel bad and it's time for me to go back. You got to study yourself in some way. The mere act of studying, that's observing. You are in the same ballpark as the uncertain principle, the uncertainty principle. The mere act of observing oneself, of saying, wait a minute, I want to change, I don't like what I am. You've already affected the thing apparently being observed. Nobody wants to take that into account. With ordinary people, it amounts to no ultimate account because it does not create change but again, it goes along with life giving the impression of, to humanity that there is continual change possible and there is continual change in some circles. So that be you or not, the change is taking place. People say it's taking place. The whole world cannot be lying. It cannot be a conspiracy against you that everyone says, all right, I've tried these methods. I've tried this kind of therapy. I've tried this kind of religious group and I changed this kind of spiritual group and they all benefited me. It's been a kind of progress I've gone through. All you've got to do, and this is no exception. People first starting this and believe that they meet up with me or read something that I wrote. They think, oh, this is it. I'm going to do exactly what you say. Give me some sort of trick. Give me something to do. And I can say something like, all right, smile. Here's a task. Smile all day Saturday. All right, I will. And just thinking about it has affected what you seem to be. Just thinking about Saturday that I'm going to do this. Or if I say out from now on, I want everyone to be aware of your breath. 24 hours a day, as long as you're awake at least, you've got to be conscious of your breathing. That has affected what seems to be you immediately as soon as you start it. And after that, you can say, all right, or I could. I say, what this is going to show you is how much the gods love you. Because the gods told me that man should be more or they should be continually conscious of their breath because that is the gift of the gods. Were it not for breath, you'd all be dead. It is part of the repayment back to the gods that you be aware that they are the ones sustaining our breathing apparatus. So now, no matter what you're doing, mad, friendly, sexually aroused, angry, greedy, whatever it is, you have got to have a continual awareness of your breathing in and your breathing out. You're breathing in, and what it's going to show you is blah, 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 blah. The change it's going to make in your life will be blah, 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 blah. Sure enough, to the same degree that you attempt to follow whatever it was, to that same degree, apparently, this has had an effect on you immediately. But I refer you back to Professor Heisenberg, the great uncertainty principle. You know, when you get to the point that you get down and see this, you can't depend any longer on what you're looking at because the mere act of looking at it has changed it immediately. What you're seeing is not what was going on before you looked at it. <laughs> now I'll go for the big money. <laughs> Combination. <laughs> Of course, Professor Heisenberg never did check with me to find out one of my principles, if you recall, is either you do or you don't. <laughs> Correctly understood in our trinary heritage, 
directly understood, that is the solution to the uncertainty principle, <laughs> is either you do or you don't. That is it. For those of you still worried or chewing on that, or those of you that's tried to forget that, that is not a binary concept. It's just you hear it as binary, as either you do or you don't. It is not. It is trinary. It eats all binary concepts, all binary principles. And it takes away, if the hair professor was still amongst us and had the ability to hear anything, then of course by now you could go and clear it up for him. But don't worry about the observations interfering of being able to, for instance, to either identify the particle's location or its momentum, to put your mind at rest that your observations are interfering with that being observed. Dear professor, remember this, either you do or you don't. And that's it. The next subject. Uh, this has general pertinence and it has some specific pertinence to people involved with this now and at future times. I'll start off using some of you people as an example to get involved with this and are meeting in other cities and people meeting here, people that I know, groups of people. You can oftentimes, it's quite common, find yourself here and believe that the people around you that you have almost found your long lost family or these people are like your best friends and from a certain viewpoint it's true. You find that you can at times exercise the privilege I've tried to enunciate for you that you have the privilege of not having to be you around some of the people involved with this. But there's a little trap there and there's a general captious area for all of humanity that I can put into Professor Fung's principle. I just made that up. <laughs> Although I, I had a character one time, he was, I think it was Bishop Jaime Fung. <laughs> and he had a principle, but I can't remember what it was, so I was blaming this one on him. That is, you should never be more familiar <laughs> You should never be more familiar with other people than you are with yourself. <laughs> this is true, as I said, this has two levels. One of them specifically among people involved with this, treating each other, but it is also true in all of life. But it's like on this basis. Let me give you a good, hard, physical example. You borrow something from someone and you get ready to return it or they ask for it back and when you got it, it was in one piece and as you hand it back to them, it's in three little pieces. <laughs> and in all sincerity, as far as hardwired people go, as far as hardwired consciousness and behavior goes, in all sincerity, you say, handing them back the pieces of this, erstwhile functional object, you say, I certainly didn't expect to break it. <laughs> Words that effect, it all means the same thing as I certainly didn't expect to. I didn't mean to, I didn't do it on purpose. You're being more familiar with other people than you are yourself. Because let me use a kind of example, this is quite common in any group of people. And of course, everyone has a small piece of this. When the right kinds of food are being taken in compared to what you are wired up to digest, everyone has a potential to do this, that is to break things. But in every group, if you've got more than two or three people, you're going to have somebody that the rest of them, if they got any intercourse with a person at all, Everybody's going to catch on. If you lend so-and-so, and whatever it is, a crowbar, <laughs> that son of a gun some way, when he brings it back to you, it's going to be broken. And everybody knows it except him. <laughs> and he'll continue to ask to borrow things, and he constantly, he'll come back, and as soon as you hear him drive up, 
and you figure, well, he's brought it with him, you know when he walks out, it's going to be in two pieces. <laughs> and you know also he's going to be just as sincere, and he's going to say, well, I certainly didn't expect to do this. But if he had been more familiar with himself at the horizontal level, he would never say that. This should be no surprise if he was more, if he was as familiar with him or herself as he was with you to borrow it and play out his old role. In life, people do it with their family. Of course, being one of the closest relationships is people continually believe I have inadvertently, not necessarily broken someone's possession. I have broken my word. I have apparently said something that caused someone else to feel mistreated, to be feel misused. And I didn't expect, I didn't intend what I said, I didn't expect to get that reaction. That is as ordinary as can be and it is completely unacceptable. You cannot continue to try and function in this kind of activity and to treat other people in a, a familiar manner, more familiar, than you are with yourself, of, hey, let me borrow that, to turn to your mother, your father, some relative, your own lover, and just, you just turn around and you open your mouth and you just run through your own hardwired programs and you say, you do things that are continually followed by, either overtly or to yourself, is, hey, I mean, the kind of reaction, the out, what seems to be the outcome of this little scene, I didn't intend that. You're being more familiar And you say, you do things that are continually followed by, either overtly or to yourself, is, hey, I mean, the kind of reaction, the out, what seems to be the outcome of this little scene, I didn't intend that. You're being more familiar with other people than you are with yourself. If you are as familiar with yourself as those around you are, you would never be saying, I did not intend to do that. I did not expect that to happen. Everyone else expected that to happen. Everyone else knows that a family reunion, when you come in, it's going to be like a pig in a payphone booth before it's over, that you show up once a year, apparently sober, and before it's over, at least, they could bet beforehand, if anybody thought to do it, that at least three people from probably other parts of the country that you only see once a year or once a decade, three people, people that you rush in and say, oh, aunt so-and-so, uncle so-and-so, and you hug them, and you talk about their little children, and you promise to write. They could all bet within two hours before the reunion's over, the family get together, at least three people are going to walk in another room and feel as though you have insulted them. And if it was pointed out to you, you're feeling be worried. I didn't, ah, I didn't expect that to happen when I said so and so. They did. Of course, that certainly doesn't apply to anyone on one of these great mystical quests like you people. <laughs> that never happens to you, right? People never accuse you of saying something and you say, wait, I was misunderstood. I didn't intend that to happen. Well, I certainly didn't mean to break your old damn hammer. Whereas the other people around you, that you said, can I borrow your hammer? Can I borrow your crowbar? Can I borrow your opinion? Can I borrow your friendship for a moment? And for whatever reason, they feel like, well, all right, I got to. I'll just kiss it. I'll just go buy another one right now. Because <laughs> they know. They know what's going to happen. They are more familiar with you than you are with you. That is certainly a big time mystic. That is certainly a person of superior consciousness. Oh, I know you think I'm being, what am I being, ironic, sardonic, 
Uh, that certainly wouldn't happen to anyone. Well, the only possible, I guess this. It is such a weighty, weighty matter involved on these great mystical quests that I do understand that many people are so involved, so continually trying to communicate with the higher spirits and the great cosmic forces that I sure, sometimes you say things you didn't mean. Sure, sometimes you'll break something. But good grief, we're all human. Uh, I didn't expect to. I'm going to use a few of these questions I've, from you people. Recently, I have observed that to me, more of the biochemical phenomenon, as you call it, referred to as fear and nervousness, seems to, or you say that it's, it begins as a physical phenomenon and then advances through the higher circuits, through the blue and then the yellow. But why should it start with red and the red circuits in non-life-threatening circumstances like playing team sports or being somewhere that I might do something to be embarrassing, et cetera? Everybody understand what seems to be the question? Then why would this happen? If it does, as I was indicating, all this has a biochemical base. And they just, the way the person put the question was, if it does start in the red circuit, that's not the way I put it, but let's leave it at that, since that's the way they phrase the question. That's not an untoward way to put the question. When it's not life-threatening, how come it comes in the red circuit? All right, who says? Who says that being embarrassed is not life-threatening? Not the person being supremely embarrassed. Not a person who suddenly feels as though they have made the world's outstanding faux pas right at this second. If you had your choice, think of the times that you've been in that position. If you had your choice, if somebody jumped out and said, you got your choice, I'll stop, I'll stop this, or I'll back off two feet and close one eye and I'm gonna take a shot at your head with this 38. How many people say, I believe I'll chance it? You know, if, you, if you'll make sure that nobody saw what I just did, how dumb I was, I, I'll give you one shot. It's worth it. <laughs> Plus, some of you followed the question, the way I chopped it up and read it. They're also asking, which people do a long time, you ask yourself this, you listen to your own inner voices, that in some way they're saying why would it start in the lower, like in the red circuits, and then simply move on up to higher circuits? Why would it even start there if it's non-life-threatening, if it's just embarrassment, and nervousness over social matters? The question is still based upon this dichotomy, this binary view, this binary reality at the ordinary level, that that which is going on in the higher circuits, like the yellow circuit, the so-called consciousness and mind of man, is in some way different from that which would be these kind of purely physical gut reactions of a loud noise, or suddenly somebody does jump out at you with a dagger. And the whole body, all the hormones, all your little molecules go into action. That this has got nothing to do with theory. This sucker has got a knife and he's about to come at me. That this is different than I have just, you know, playing tennis, I just took a swipe and the racket went up here and I suddenly I tripped and my pants split and I fell down <laughs> all simultaneously and the ball still went over my head, that in some way that's different. Or that I was staying up to make an important speech and just as I began to talk, I farted. <laughs> Here in this quiet room, that that is different from the guy jumping out with a dagger, that one of them is purely physical and the other one is somewhere in this kind of vague world of personality. What in the hell do you think personality is? How many times are we going to go through this? The yellow circuit is just as biochemical, it is just as molecular based as the red circuit. 
as what other people call the life of the body. That the so-called physical fear of someone with a knife is based upon the same kind of molecular reaction to what seems to be the environment going on, the circumstance. Is your reaction to it is based upon the same thing as it is that you walk out and you feel stage fright when they say, right, tonight you've got to make a speech at the Young Men's Petunia Association. It's your turn. And just before you walk out, you feel like, I'm going to throw up, I'm going to faint, I'm getting dizzy. And it's not life-threatening, I'm just embarrassed. I'm afraid of what people are going to say. I don't know whether I can speak good. I don't, I don't know how I look. That that is different from the guy attacking me with a dagger, and it's not. I'm glad I could clear that up. Here's a good one. Why is it so seemingly difficult at the ordinary level to understand what people are saying to each other? People engage in conversation. At times there seems there are all kinds of perceptions and opinions available between the people, and yet somehow something seems to have been missed at an ordinary level. And what they're saying is that them listening to people talk, and at times something seems to be going on, but to them, I can't tell what am I missing, the importance of it. All right, does everybody follow that? Because that is a quiet whether any of you have ever put in those words, look around. And you can observe that just moment by moment. Just walk down the street corner, get on a bus, a subway. Watch people who have been married 50 years. Watch mother and daughter, father and son, best of friends. It continues. You can listen to people talk, and you have a certain way. And think, what the hell? Is anybody, does anybody understand what they're saying to each other? I'm missing. You know, is it some kind of trick? All right. What if, what if, in many instances, there is nothing to comprehend? <laughs> that, of course, for you people who are newer to hearing me map out the strange land, it's not an attack on humanity. It's not to say that people are idiots and people are confused. It's none of that. But the kinds of transfers of energy, the play between one person being the entertainer, the other person being the audience, and then changing back and forth, the transfer of heat, oftentimes can have nothing to do with what would apparently be the verbal or even so-called emotional content of what's going on. It is strictly mechanical talk. The example I've used sometimes, women heretofore have not been exposed to it much, but I think now women can get into most locker rooms and health clubs and places. The example I used to use when we were more men here than women, go into a locker room or go hang out on a ball field after you've seen a bunch of guys playing softball or baseball for a couple of hours or soccer. But the locker room seems to be the great place, like the game's over, and go in there, hide behind a door. If you want to think, that, hey, there are people talking, and there ain't nothing going on, and I can't figure out what the purpose is. It's just a prime example. Just as much talk as you would ever want to hear. Ten people talking simultaneously, and you listen, and nothing is being said. <laughs> nothing of any importance. Nobody seems to be listening to anybody else. And yet you peek around, and in a sense, they seem to be listening, because nobody's jumping up and telling everybody else to shut up and listen to me. It's a transfer of energy. And as far as looking, in many, many instances, as far as looking for some verbal, some observable verbal content or importance, there may be none. To even look for a nonverbal, to believe, all right, there's some kind of emotional, there's some kind of personal psychological game perhaps going on that I can't catch. It may be even more basic than that. So that you don't have to go around and hang around locker rooms and hide behind doors because there are those that would, could ask you embarrassing questions. <laughs> Especially if you were still dressed up like Carmen Miranda, some of you men. <laughs> but rather than do that, run that risk, all you have to do is listen back into your own past or on a good warm day when you've forgotten about me, find yourself staying out on the street corner there at work Worse than that, seeing the car talking to the radio. <laughs> Listen to yourself. And then put that together, we're wondering, sometimes do I miss the importance of what other people are saying? Sometimes do I, 
do I not comprehend any importance? Do I not comprehend what's going on with me talking to somebody? Once you see that, the idea which the observation was a fair one to start with, of seeing other people apparently talk, and then many times you cannot comprehend what's going on. True, which I've covered. But now go back and start here. I just ask you, it's just a possibility. Just listen to you and see if you can comprehend why, what's going on every time you talk. If you get all that covered and then you still can't figure out, you know, this question about sometimes what am I missing and I can't comprehend what other people's doing, then come ask me personally and we'll get to the bottom of it. All right, here's one I like. I'm going to read a good bit of it. Now listen. At times I seem to be able to envision a way in which two or three. Let me start all over. I need to be editing this. I seem to be able to envision, I'm going to make it read like I want to. I seem to be able to envision a way in which three or more people might work together to accomplish something that requires all of them working on different components of a project, coordinating their talents, pooling their resources, and just generally working together in an intelligent, efficient, speedy, and effective manner, in which minor details receive only the minute amount of time they deserve, and et cetera. And everybody does that, which is required to ensure that everything comes out right the first time. However, I can't help but notice that I have never, it seems, seen this arrangement happen. Three or more people. Forget the way I started to read what the person wrote. It should have been three or more. What is going on here? An appendium to the question. Why is it so often incredibly difficult for people to merely talk about possible ways, that is, three or more people, possible ways of doing something in a pertinent, practical, and productive manner? Think about that a second. That is a fair observation once I edited it a little bit. Two people, you and somebody else, or you could observe two other people. And it's not difficult at all, just under any ordinary condition, that you and somebody else seem to can sit down and fairly easily come to an agreement wherein you seem to both agree what the plan is, you can assign parts, and that you and another person can seem to take off and start working on your parts. You can check back in with each other. Now forget whether the outcome is exactly like you planned, because if you believe the outcome is always exactly as you planned, you don't belong here, you belong back in day school. Two people, apparently there is a real basis for them getting together. Apparently the whole world, if you go me right quick, is based upon at least two people. And usually at most two people. It can be two groups of people with a spokesman. But there are two groups of people can apparently concoct a plan, agree on the plan, divide the labor. They can even subdivide it among themselves. The group one will say, all right, I'm going to divide this in my group. But it's on the basis of two people you get three people and you try to do what the person starts saying. To plan something requires all of them working on different components, coordinating their tasks, pooling their resources, generally working together. You put three people in that and the observation is correct. They went, this is my kind of observation. They say, I have practically never seen such an arrangement happen. That is a fair observation. I would also suggest that the person wrote it based upon some of their own experiences and not just observation. How about all of you? How many times have you been, first off, how many times have you ever found, unless I interfered with it or something strange happened, that you would ever get down and try to put together a project and divide it up into three different groups? I'm not saying this never happens in life, that a group of people, just ordinary people, can sit around in a business you know, partners, 
the officers of a corporation, and they try to divide up. All right, let this group do this, and let this group do this. And then somebody said, well, wait, now somebody needs to take care of so-and-so. And they said, oh, okay, we'll get, uh, get the typing pool or get uh, advertising to take care of that. That you may seem to have three or maybe more. But you watch it. If this thing is going to live, if this little animal they put together, this new plan is going to live, it's going to end up, if it's going to be efficient at all, it's going to end up where it is looked upon by the participants is being two counts. And very often it gets down to the two counts are this. We're doing our share. It may be count. Let's say they start off with four groups of, in the business, one through four. It'll end up being, say, one, two, and three group against the fourth group. That we're doing our share, but it's these guys. It will come down that the impression, and the impression is the reality of it at that level, that it's two groups. They cannot hold on to the notion that it's three. If they do, the whole thing's falling apart. <laughs> Somebody has pulled the plug on the ark and Noah didn't notice it. It is going down, it is falling apart before their very eyes. They may even, somebody along the line may say, you know what we did? We got too many cooks in here. We got too many Indians. Or we got too many chiefs. Or we got too many Indians. <laughs> It got too complicated. I mean, people, they're not communicating. They're not, this group's not reporting. The whole, what right, we should do is scrap this, probably, and start all over. All of you have had enough experience, but it's not necessary that you would have ever noticed this. But if you ever sit down with just three people, if it's just a little stamp collecting club, and you decide to expand your horizons, we need new people, or let's put on a yearly, let's start a yearly stamp collectors get together here in Akron. And they're, they're 10 little members. And you decide, and you sit down, and three people, and they pick out more or less three, or somebody picks it out, three specific areas that you're in charge of this, I'll be in charge of that, and you're in charge of that. Does everybody understand? Now, we've got to coordinate our efforts. We're going to do it quick. But these are specific things you've got to do, yeah? And you've got to do this, yeah? And that's clear. You don't fool this. You do that. I'll do mine. Here's, here's it is. We're going to do it. When have you ever seen that happen? It's very seldom it even apparently happens in the planning stage. But if you've ever been in it, when has that ever gone anywhere? When have you ever been involved with it? If it does stay alive for any length of time and does crawl along, it ends up, it's apparently two. It's you and somebody else and then the other person. Or it's them two and you. That I'm having to carry this whole damn thing. I'm having to do what they should have been doing. They get together and drink coffee every Thursday. I know they keep inviting me by showing up and they don't do anything but sit around and gossip. They don't do their job. I'm going to have to do it all. Of course, their opinion <laughs> does not necessarily jibe with yours, their view of it. That, I think, is my only comment on that. But this is a task for you people who have, fit, who have met the requirements of attendance for the months that I indicated earlier. It's between now and next week, the next time you see the next tape, I want you to do this. I want you to go out, get out of the city as far as possible, get out in a park or get out in a rural environment. We'll be using this off and on. So find you a place to get away from people and cars as much as possible. And for three times between now and the next time you meet, I want you to take a 45 minute walk by yourself. I want you to just walk along at a nice, comfortable pace. And for the 45 minutes, I want you to try and answer me this question. Is every time that you can remember to do so, turn back on yourself, that is on your own little mind. And I want you to see this continual activity. It's going on up here. I want you to answer the question. You're turning, you look at it. And you might remember a good old Professor Heisenberg, and yours truly. You'll only have a split little eons to catch a glimpse of what was going on. But I want you to tell me what was going up here. Was it operational in words and pictures, or words and are pictures? 
continue to do that, you'll see quite easily that you start walking and you try to do it and then you get involved with what you thought you saw and there's a whole lot more to learn besides what I'm saying. Keep your eyes open but the extensive purpose of this, what I want you to attempt to answer in these three 45 minute walks is what is going on up here when it's just operating as it always is, just running mechanically, the energy running through the yellow circuit. Is what was going on as soon as I can remember to try and look at it was what going on? Was it a series of word, verbal activities? Was it pictures or was it a combination of the two? Very pregnant 